Um, wonderful. Thank you. Thanks um, for starting us off, Renee, and thank you, Erin, for doing the organizing here. It's just an enormous pleasure to say good afternoon to everyone and to welcome you to our cross-college colloquium. We have the most outstanding research going on in the college, and the goal of this um, seminar series is to ensure that everyone knows, regardless of your discipline, of your department, to be able to be exposed to the outstanding work that our faculty and our students are doing. Today, we are delighted that Dr. Jose Perea, who joined us just last year, is going to discuss his fascinating, important research with us. But I am not going to introduce him. That I'm going to pass off to Brad Turo, one of our PhD students. And Brad, please take it away. Hey. So our speaker today is Dr. Jose Perea an associate professor in the Department of Mathematics in the Cowery College of Computer Sciences. Prior to Northeastern, he held positions as an assistant professor of CMSE in mathematics at Michigan State and as a visiting assistant professor of mathematics at Duke University. He holds a PhD in mathematics from Stanford University and a BS in mathematics from Universidad del Valle, Colombia. He uh, is the inaugural 2022 to 2024 lecturer for the Mathematical Association of America and the National Association of Mathematics, a recipient of the 2020 NSF Career Award, a 2020 honoree of Lathisms, and a 2018 honoree of Mathematically Gifted and Black. A talented speaker and educator, he exudes warmth, patience, and passion for his work. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jose Perez. It's a very generous introduction. Uh, thanks, Brad. Um, so should I should I start? I guess that's what you do after you're introduced. Um, so hello, everybody. Um, uh, today I want to I want to talk to you about uh, topological data analysis. What is it? Um, so I thought I would start with a with a story. Um, so this is the town of Konigsberg in the 1700s. Uh, this is a modern day Kaliningrad. Uh, so this is a Russian city uh, between uh, Poland and Lithuania, uh, but in the, in the 1700s, as, as you can see from the from the depiction, uh, Konigsberg was uh, divided into several pieces. So the city had uh, two banks in the river Pregel, and then uh, sort of two islands in the middle, and all of these pieces were connected uh, via bridges. Uh, so there is one bridge right here, and then another bridge right here. Uh, there's actually seven of them connecting all the all the pieces of, of the town, uh, and then the inhabitants of, of Konigsberg would you know take their, their their daily walks around the town. And one question was, is it possible to traverse all the bridges only once in this walk you are taking? Okay, is it possible to traverse all the seven bridges of Konigsberg? only once in your uh, mid-afternoon walk. Um, so Lord, Leonard Euler uh, was a, a Swiss mathematician uh, working in St. Petersburg at the time. Uh, so Euler is one of the giants of mathematics. He had his fingers in every mathematical pie. And, and he, this is what he had to say about this problem when he, had, when, when he caught wind of it. So in, 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 a, in a letter to one of his colleagues, he says, this question is so banal, but seemed to me worthy of attention in that neither geometry nor algebra, nor even the art of counting was sufficient to solve it. Um, so Euler wasn't you know, super impressed by the problem of walking around Konigsberg, but what he's articulating is that uh, the toolbox of mathematics at the time didn't seem to have the right elements to answer these kinds of questions. Um, that's, a, that's a deep observation, right? So he's saying, you know, the problem maybe is not as interesting, but it seems the math we have is not enough to, to help us solve it. Uh, he was hoping to have something to compute that would tell him whether or not there was such a, such a walk, right? Um, so this is what Euler did to, to, to attack this problem. So he said, you know what? The, the size of the land masses, how big they are, is not very important. So let me just represent them with nodes. Uh, then he said, you know, how, how long the bridges are is also not important. 
Uh, so let me just represent them via edges. And, um, you know, you arrive to these sort of uh, picture of the problem where you have a graph with nodes and edges, and you're asking, is it possible to traverse this graph by moving through every edge only once, right? So he's abstracted the, the Konigsberg problem to a question in graph theory. Um, so nowadays, this type of, of sort of visualization is very common to us. We have a great Institute of Network Sciences here at Northeastern. Uh, but in the time of Euler, network sciences did not exist, right? So this is actually the genesis of graph theory and network sciences. He was the first one to think of, of, of these kinds of, of formalizations. Um, so the question now is, what can you compute about a graph that does not depend on the length of the edges or the size of the nodes that would tell you if there is one of these uh, beautiful walks you want to take in, in Konigsberg? Um, so Euler says, let's compute something called the degree or something that we now call the degree. Uh, the degree is going to be for every node, you're going to count how many edges go into it. So for example, uh, every node has degree three, sort of three edges going into it, except this node here in the middle that has five edges going into it. Uh, and again, now this becomes a question not, not of Konigsberg, but any graph that you can draw. So here's what Euler proved. So Euler proved the following. If your graph G has an Eulerian path, he didn't call it Eulerian, that's what we call it today. But if the, graph, if the graph has an Eulerian path, meaning a walk that traverses every edge exactly once, then when you count how many nodes have odd degree, then you better have no nodes with odd degree, or you better have only two nodes with odd degree, right? So if, a, if, if an Eulerian walk is to exist, then this condition has to be satisfied. So when you go to Konigsberg and you look at the graph that represents it, you see, whoa, there are four nodes with odd degree, no Eulerian path, right? So this is a deep um, observation in the sense that Euler took a problem where, um, you know, quantities were not that important, how big the bridges were, how big the land masses were. The numbers were not rigid. The, 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 things were sort of flabby. And, and, and he was able to compute something to solve a series of problems. And with that, he created graph theory and topology. Um, so I recently moved to, to Boston, as, as you know, from the introduction. And I've been looking at this map uh, for a while now. And um, what I want you to notice is that this map is not geographically, ge geographically correct, right? The, the lines of the T are not straight. Uh, they, you know, they wind and they curve. And, and distances are, are also not one-to-one, -one. Uh, but that's okay. Those quantities are not needed to represent the information in the, in the network of the T if, you, if you're looking into your morning commute. Um, so that's topology. Topology is the mathematical study of mathematical objects, uh, and we don't care about deforming them a little bit. Um, so uh, in, in, in topology, at least, uh, the joke is that uh, a topologist cannot distinguish a coffee mug from a donut because you can deform one into the other continuously, just like Euler did. Um, what is topological data analysis? So um, is what I do, <laughs> but, but more importantly is taking the same approach that Euler took uh, using ideas from mathematics, geometry to solve problems where the idea of shape is what is important, okay? So that's what we're gonna be talking about today. Um, so let me show you some things we can compute about uh, shapes and, and, and that we compute all the time in topology. So on the left, we have uh, a, a sphere, S2. So that's the, the surface of a, of a basketball. And then on the right, we have the torus, which is the, the surface of the donut. Um, one of the things we can compute in topology uh, about just the shape of the space is what are called the Betty numbers of the space. Um, our uh, PhD math students uh, spend quite a while in their topology class defining Betty numbers uh, you know, mathematically, but we don't need that definition today, just the, the, the geometric intuition. 
Uh, let me explain what they are. So Betty Zero measures the number of connected pieces that you have in your space. So uh, both uh, the sphere and the torus are both just one connected piece. And that's why Betty Zero is equal to one, right? So it's got one zero dimensional hole, one component. Betty One, on the other hand, measures the number of uh, loops or, 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 or holes that you have in your space. Uh, and by a hole, I really mean sort of a closed loop uh, that bounds sort of an empty space. Um, so if you look at, at the sphere, every time you draw a closed loop, you will see that it's filled in by a sort of a, by a spherical cap, right? And that's why the sphere does not have one dimensional holes. Um, but if you look at the torus, um, you hopefully will, will see that the curve in, in blue bounds an empty region and the curve in red also bounds an empty region because the, the torus is, is hollow. You can sort of put your hand through the, through the red curve. And that's why we say that Betty one of the torus is equal to two, two one dimensional holes. And then finally, uh, Betty two uh, measures the number of two dimensional holes. So this is sort of closed surfaces that bound empty uh, space in the middle. Uh, so the sphere itself is a sort of a close to dimensional object that has three dimensional empty space inside it. And the torus is also a closed two dimensional surface that bounds sort of an empty three dimensional space inside it. And that's why Betty two is equal to one. So hopefully the, um, the geometric intuition makes sense that these Betty numbers capture the number of holes you have in your space in several dimensions. Just like degree, when we saw the, the Euler story, just like degree, they can be computed and there are algorithms and there are mathematical definitions. But again, we don't need those right now. Just the, hopefully the, the geometric intuition is enough. Um, let me now move to the land of data. So suppose now that you have a data set, like the collection of points I'm showing on the, on the screen now. Uh, so every point, in the, on the screen is gonna be an observation in your data set. So maybe it's a, a text document or an image or, or some gene expression panel you, you, you performed. Um, from, a, from, from, the, from the eyes of, of a topologist, this kind of looks like a, like a circle, maybe. Um, but mathematically speaking, it, it, it really isn't. Um, if you compute uh, Betty zero of it, sort of how many components do I have? then you have exactly as many as data points, right? Because it's completely disconnected. Um, if you look at Betty one, which again captures the number of holes that sort of close loops that bound an empty region, you also get zero because it's not possible to draw a continuous loop across these disconnected data points. So what do you do, right? You do, you do sort of the obvious thing. Uh, you connect things that are nearby, right? So what we're going to do is, you know, for every two data points that are very close, we're going to draw an edge. Uh, if three data points are close, we're going to draw the triangle. And if four are very close, we draw the tetrahedron and so on in higher dimensions. And what we do then is we increase the tolerance of things we allow to connect. And hopefully what you're seeing here is that by this point, sort of the circular topology of the data uh, has been sort of reconstructed. Right, and we continue adding things until the circle is sort of covered. Um, and this is what we do in, in topological data analysis. We take uh, data sets, compute sort of geometric objects on top of them, like these sort of sequence of triangulated spaces, and then compute uh, quantities about these, these triangulated spaces, like the Betty numbers, okay? So just to summarize, um, here's my data set on the, on the upper left. And, and here's a reconstruction of these sort of triangulations at different scales. You know, again, when three data points are close, I draw the, the triangle and, 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 and I increase the uh, sort of how far out I go to, to join things. Um, again, as I said before, uh, we can compute the Betty numbers, which correspond to the number of holes that your space has in each dimension. Uh, so let's go ahead and do that for each one of the, of the, of the triangulated spaces we, we get. Um, 
by the way, uh, each each dot, each blue dot here at the bottom is supposed to give you the count of the Betty number. So in the lower left, we have Betty n equals to three. Um, this does not correspond to the picture on the top. So I, I apologize for the inconsistency between the image and the, and the count at the bottom. But nonetheless, uh, hopefully the, the idea is clear that we can compute Betty numbers uh, across this family of, of triangulations. Um, and then not only do we have all these Betty numbers, but we also have ways of, of tracking how they relate to each other as I increase the scale. And if, if you get nothing else from the, from the talk, hopefully that's not the case, but if you get nothing else, this is the technical, this is the technical part. Uh, we represent the overall shape of a data set using these barcodes. And what the barcodes do is that they give you a count of how many holes the space has at different scales, okay? These long bars are telling you that there is a hole that persists through a wide range of scales and bars that are very short are holes that appear and then get filled in very quickly, okay? So if we go back to the, to the torus, to our torus example, um, here are the Betty numbers, again, uh, one component that is Betty zero, uh, two holes that is Betty one, one void that is uh, Betty two. And I did the following experiment. I went ahead and took a random sample from the torus. That's what you see on the lower left. And I computed the barcodes as I described earlier. And, and hopefully what you're seeing is that uh, the barcode in dimension zero has sort of a long bar uh, the barcode in dimension one has sort of long, sort of has two long bars and then a bunch of smaller ones. And then Betty two has one long bar and a bunch of smaller ones. And what I'm hoping is that you will see how uh, the barcodes tell you, or at least suggest what the Betty numbers of the underlying space should be, okay? And, and, and we do this in topology all the time, right? We take data, we measure something about it, and then that tells us sort of the likely spaces that parameterize your data set, right? Um, let me do a, an example, like a real, real example. So, so here's a data set of, of, of images of a, of a little duck and, and, and the little duck is in sort of several positions, okay? Um, when you look at an image, uh, that's just sort of a big matrix that has the pixel values in the entries, okay? Yeah, we can compute distances between matrices by how different their entries are, just like a, a Euclidean distance. Uh, and we can just think of that as a data set and ask the question, what is the shape of this, uh, of this data set? Um, so I went ahead and computed the, the barcodes for it. And, and here's what I got. Um, in dimension zero, again, you get a long bar and then comparably smaller ones. So the data is sort of connected one piece. And then dimension one, you get sort of one long bar and then smaller ones. So the data probably has a hole in dimension one. So here's a, a visualization of the data using some other techniques. Um, and hopefully what you can see is that the data is arranged in, in a circle, right? In a loop. Uh, and what the loop is parameterizing is sort of the direction of the, of the little dock. And that is exactly suggested by the barcodes we computed in the previous slide. Okay, great. Um, what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna take sort of this machinery and apply it to hopefully interesting problems in data science. Uh, and we can talk more about the, the implications in a moment. Um, so one problem that is sort of surprisingly commonplace in data science is uh, the question of detecting recurrent patterns in, in time series data, right? So if you have a phenomenon that varies over time and you wanna predict the future, then it is good to know that uh, the past is repeating, right? Um, so uh, here are some examples of sort of recurrent processes in, 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 in data. Uh, so in the top left, here I'm showing the, the median uh, house price uh, Z-score. Uh, and, and, and this is used to, to argue that the, that the house market uh, goes in, in cycles. Um, on the lower left, a little bit more interesting, um, this is uh, gene expression data 
from uh, the cell division, for, from the cell cycle. Um, and what you can see is that sort of the, the, the gene expression levels are uh, sort of expressed in a, in a, in a repeating fashion. Um, and, and more broadly, um, biological organisms have a bunch of sort of clock regulated processes. Uh, so cell division is one of them, but you can also think of the circadian clock, right? So when are you hungry? When, you, when are you asleep? Um, and, and, and the belief is that all of these sort of clock regulated cycles happen at the genetic level. So you would like to find what are the genes responsible for or that participate in a particular clock regulated process and then how these genes talk to each other to regulate that process. Okay, so, so here's a, a very sort of naive question or you know, commonplace question, which is uh, you know, what is recurrence in data, science, in, in data sets and how do we go about quantifying it? Okay, what is recurrence? How do we quantify it? Um, so here's a sort of a very sort of simple-minded way of doing that. So imagine that you have your time series, right? So the curve in red, um, and we're gonna uh, fix a uh, parameter w that is gonna be the size of our windows. Um, and what we're gonna do is for every uh, value of t, for every time value, we're gonna look at the window or the, the sort of the fraction of the function between t and t plus w, okay? So we get sort of a snippet from the function uh, between those times. So if you go ahead and arrange these snippets by similarity, meaning that uh, if they're closer, it means that they're more similar, then repetition of snippets uh, should be reflected in sort of circularity of the arrangement of snippets, correct? And, and this is sort of the, the, the topological, the place where topology makes sense to come in, right? So we're asking the question, are these snippets ar arranged in a circle? We don't care if the circle is twisted. We don't care if the if the twisted is if the circle is very big. We just want to know if, if if we're seeing a circular pattern, and if that is the case, then we can say that that there is repetition in the in the time series. Um, so here's what what we what we do algorithmically, right? So uh, we take our our time series, uh, call it F, um, and we're gonna um, fix a, a, a sort of two parameters, uh, tau, which is gonna be the step we're gonna, uh, which we're gonna look at our time series, and d, which is the the dimension of of this sliding window construction. Um, by the way, sliding windows comes from the fact that when you vary t, it's as if you were sliding the window from left to right. Uh, so what you do is you you evaluate your function f at uh, the times f uh, at, at times t, t plus tau, t plus two tau, and all the way up to t plus d tau. So you're essentially discretizing the window uh, between t and t plus d tau. And what you do next is you take all of these vectors, you know, you put them in, in Rd. And, and again, properties of the, of the time series will be reflected in the shape of this curve you're generating in Rd plus one. If the time series is periodic or recurrent, uh, you will observe a closed curve in, in Rd plus one, okay? So here are some examples of, of other types of, of, of recurrences that generate other sort of interesting spaces, right? So if, you're, if your function really is periodic, the one at the top, then you, your sort of a sliding windows point cloud is gonna be a circle, maybe twisted, but a closed curve uh, nonetheless. Uh, there's another type of recurrence called quasi-periodicity, uh, which we're gonna uh, see a little bit more about in, in a moment. But uh, the type of, of object that you get by sliding the windows has the shape of a torus, right? The surface of the donut. And, and this type of sort of uh, equilateral or, or sort of this parallelogram of, of recurrence, uh, it turns out to, to fill out a two-dimensional sphere. Uh, so people in dynamical systems know all about these types of sort of parallels between time series data and what they call attractors. And the shape of those attractors tell you a lot about the, the recurrent patterns. Okay, so now this gives you a pipeline to understand recurrence in, in, in time series data, right? So uh, you start with your time series on the left, you do this sliding window construction, you get your point cloud. 
you, you go through this process of, you know, joining points that are together with edges, triangles, and so on. And then you compute these barcodes to, to figure out if you have a circle or not, right? And then if you have a long bar, that is sort of representative of a very strong circular pattern in the, in the point cloud to generate it, okay? So we're gonna use this in several applications in a moment. Um, but before you can do that, um, and, and this is a sort of a, an ad, I'm, I'm advocating for, for why mathematicians do what mathematicians do, is that before you can apply these things, you need to understand choices and how they affect the results you're going to get. Uh, so what happens if you choose a different D or a different tau? What happens if you add noise to the time series? How do your results change? Um, so we actually went ahead and, and did all that. Uh, and there is a paper if you want to read it. But again, this is part of what, ma what mathematicians do. They build some pipelines and try to understand how they work so that people can actually implement them. Um, so the, the first application we, we went for was this idea of biological clocks, okay? So we were interested in, in trying to discover genes that were expressed in, in periodic patterns in, in biological systems. And, and again, the, the, the paper is, is here if you're, if you're interested. Um, but let me tell you what the story was. Um, so we start with, a, uh, with, a, with, a, with data that biologists uh, sort of gave us. Um, and in this data set, each row is supposed to represent a gene. Um, so if, I, if I remember correctly, this comes from, um, from, from mice that uh, sort of, they, they, they sort of take a, a bunch of mice, they synchronize their circadian clocks, and then every hour they take a mouse and do a gene expression panel, okay? So that will generate one of these columns, okay? So again, each row is supposed to represent a gene in the, in the mouse, and then the columns are telling you how the gene expression is changing with time. And then the biologists were like, can you please, please, please uh, order these rows from most periodic to less periodic because we wanna find genes that are repetitive. Um, and, you, know, you would ask them, what do you mean by periodic? And they would tell you, no, we don't know, but you know, they, they will look repetitive, right? Um, so we applied this idea of you know, sliding windows and barcodes and so on. And these are the genes we got at the top of the ranking using topology. Um, and hopefully you can see them. Those are the plots of the actual gene expression. Um, and yes, they look uh, very, very periodic. Um, if you look at the bottom of the ranking, uh, you will see genes like this that do not look very repetitive, right? Um, and then when we compared to other sort of state-of-the-art methods at the time, um, what we found was that the topological idea uh, found genes that when you look at them, right, they look very repetitive, but when you try to find them with other state-of-the-art methods, you would lose them, okay? So we discovered a, a few sort of periodic genes that were interesting. Okay, cool. Genes, topology, great. Um, the next frontier was analyzing uh, videos, right? Because if you think of a video, that is just a sequence of images, right? Before we had a sequence of, of values, you know, gene expressions, uh, but now we have the frames. And you can do the exact same construction, right? So you can do sliding windows of frames. Uh, and you can ask the same idea, is my video repetitive? Am I seeing recurrence in the video? And these sort of sliding windows uh, tend to be very good at capturing that in, in, in these sort of point clouds. Um, so we went on the, on the internet and uh, sort of got a bunch of videos, um, you know, some of them repetitive, some of them not that repetitive. Um, and then we, we went to, um, to this great service that, that Amazon had at, at the time, uh, which is uh, Amazon's Mechanical Turk. And it allows you to, uh, to get training data for machine learning purposes. Um, so we took all of those videos and you know, paid a bunch of participants to uh, compare these videos. You know, does this look more repetitive to you than this other video? Uh, what you're seeing here is exactly what the participants were seeing. Um, and then we used uh, what humans determined to be repetitive or recurrent to then compare to other sort of state-of-the-art machine learning methods. Um, and, and, and here are uh, sort of 
correlation comparisons between what humans think is repetitive and what other machine learning methods think is repetitive in video. Um, and bigger is better here. Um, so what we're seeing here is that uh, sort of sliding windows is sort of more in line with what humans uh, think is repetitive, which is essentially what you want in, in perceptual tasks. Okay. Um, hopefully by, by this time, you're getting a, a feel for the type of, of tools and, and, and possibilities that topological ideas can, can reach. Um, so we started with the, with the story of Euler, right? Where you, where, you, where you have problems that are not super rigid that you can deform in order to solve them. And, and hopefully I've been able to convey that there are data science questions where the same frame of mind can be applied. Um, for, the, um, for the remainder of the talk, I'm gonna use a slightly different visualization of the barcode, uh, which contains the same information, but it's just gonna be easier to, to, to explain. Um, so again, the barcode is just a, it's a collection of sort of horizontal intervals. Um, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna replace it with what is called the persistence diagram. So if you have a bar that starts at A and ends at B in the barcode, we're just gonna code it as a point of coordinates A comma B on the plane, okay? So the same information, just a, a different uh, visualization. Um, so here's some work out of uh, NC State. Uh, so this is my colleague, uh, Edgar Lobaton. I wasn't involved in this, but I'm, I'm gonna bring it up because I thought it was a, just a great example. Um, so here's what, we did, what they did. Um, they were interested in, in doing sort of classification of movement, right? So they would take different subjects and put uh, sensors on their uh, joints. And, and they would take sort of the, the sensor data and try to use that to, uh, uh, to infer what, what movement they were, they were making, okay? So uh, they went ahead and took, you know, the time series they got from those joints and applied the same techniques I uh, explained you know, a while ago, this idea of forming these sort of a sliding window point clouds, and then using the, uh, the corresponding persistence diagram as a way to encode the shape of the point cloud you're getting, okay? Um, so here are three types or four types of, of movements. Uh, so there's walking, waving, uh, bicycling, and, and golfing. And again, for each one of those, you have sensors, and from those sensors, you, you, you sort of construct these, these point clouds uh, and use the, the persistence uh, diagrams to encode the shapes of those, of those point clouds. Um, so they went ahead and, and, and used them for classification purposes. Uh, you know, are you walking? Are you golfing? Are you waving or sitting? Uh, and, you know, with very high uh, classification accuracy. Okay. So, um, I want to I want to sort of get, segue towards the end of the talk by by showing you other types of applications where it's not only circles that are important or, or recurrence. Um, as I said before, um, you know, uh, if you have a periodic function like cosine of t plus cosine of three t, then when you compute when you compute the the sliding window point cloud, you get a circle. Um, I have talked about or mentioned in passing that you have these functions called quasi-periodic. Uh, so what they are is uh, superpositions of periodic functions like cosine of t and cosine of pi t, but then the frequencies are not multiples of each other, are not related via rational numbers. So when you have something periodic, your, your sliding window point cloud turns out to be a circle. But when you have a quasi-periodic signal, the sliding window point cloud turns, turns out to be a, a torus. And, and that is something we very strongly uh, sort of can quantify using these persistence diagrams. Um, just a comment, if you were to use things like, you know, like spectral theory, like Fourier analysis, it is harder to see these types of, of behaviors. Um, but at any rate, um, we took the idea of uh, recurrence in video data, as we had said before, and, and we applied it to these other types of sort of uh, superpositions of periodic signals. So here's a, an exercise for the audience. Uh, so you're looking at a, at a video, hopefully, of two dots moving from left to right. Uh, as I said before, humans are supposed to be the best at perceptual tasks. Uh, question, uh, do you think the, the dots 
uh, sort of synchronized at some point, meaning that the frequency of one is a multiple, a rational multiple of the frequency of the other. Um, so it's, it's sort of hard to say, right? Um, but if you compute the, the sliding window point cloud, uh, you get a torus and the sliding window, the, the persistent homology tells you that, or the barcode tells you that you do have these two holes that really tell you that there is a torus. Uh, when we generated this example, the frequencies really were non-commensurate. So we, we rigged the example to, to produce this effect. And just to show you that even though humans are very good at perceptual tasks, these types of, 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 uh, of experiments are hard um, for, for humans. So um, I think I, okay, so this is the experiment I want to show you. Um, so this is data from uh, the uh, speech lab at, at, at Michigan State when I was there. Um, and what they do is they, they want to understand the physiology of, of voice, right? So they take uh, high-speed video recordings of, you know, how the muscles move in your vocal cavity. Uh, so this is uh, vocal folds, right? So they take a, my, uh, sort of a, a camera through the nose of the, of the person and then sort of take a, a high-speed video of, of how things move. Um, so normal uh, participants uh, tended to exhibit sort of a lot of regularity, a lot of recurrence in, the, in, in how their uh, muscles moved. And, and that was very clearly demonstrated in the sort of sliding window point clouds and in the persistence diagram, sort of a very nice circle. Um, there's this other condition called uh, sort of clinical asymmetry or biphonation where uh, you have uh, pieces that are moving at clashing frequencies. Um, and when you construct, again, the, 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 the sliding window point clouds, this type of behavior emerges in sort of this toroidal uh, topology, which is very clearly demonstrated in the, or captured by the, by the persistence diagrams. Um, so we went ahead and, you know, took sort of a larger database of, of, of different types of behaviors and, and were able to sort of automatically classify sort of different types of conditions from the video data alone. Right. So what they did before that was by hand, you know, pay a couple of grad students to, to really sort of delineate by hand the different frames and try to quantify things by hand. Uh, and this sort of allowed a more sort of automated process. Um, I want to finish with the following uh, point. Uh, hopefully uh, by now uh, you're seeing that, that this idea of computing sort of a shape descriptor like these persistence diagrams and then asking, does this look like walking, waving, or does this look like a torus or a circle? Um, it's a problem that you can get a lot of, or an idea that you can get a lot of mileage out of, right? Um, so um, I'm going to focus on this question in the last five minutes. Um, and, and, and here it is. So um, there is this cool data set, the, the protein classification benchmark collection, where they have sort of a bunch of proteins, um, meaning sort of the position of, of the atoms in, in sort of in, in, in 3D space. And, and they have a bunch of classification tasks. Um, so one thing you can do is you can compute these types of descriptors, like the persistence diagrams for these molecules, right? For these proteins. Um, and the thing to notice is that if you take the molecule and you rotate it, the persistence diagram is not gonna change. If you take the molecule and you move it left to right, the persistence diagram is not gonna change. So this is gonna give you sort of uh, representations or features that are invariant under certain transformations, okay? So some of the work we've, we've done recently is to try and, and you know, uh, come up with machine learning uh, pipelines that can classify automatically using these types of features, using these persistence diagrams as features, okay? So let me just give you a flavor for what that looks like, and, and, and I'll end with the with the protein classification uh, benchmark. Um, so yeah, so that's the, that's the appropriate uh, paper. Um, so, so say that you have a, one of these persistence diagrams, right? So just a bunch of points in, in, in R2. Um, so um, we call a, a template is gonna be a function F uh, from these sort of, from the wedge, right? So the upper triangular part where the points are and with values on, on the real numbers. 
Um, and we're going to use these functions, again, which we call templates because we're going to move them around and sort of shrink the, their size and enlarge their size to come up with ways of doing machine learning with these persistence diagrams. Um, so here's the sort of mathematical remark for, for, for the mathematicians in the, in the audience, or the mathematically inclined in the audience, rather. Um, so if you take one of these persistence diagrams and you sort of evaluate your template function f on each point and you add up the values, then that gives you something that is continuous from diagrams to real numbers. Um, if you're a machine learning person, think of these as an activation function that is going to be very large if there is a lot of points in the sort of region of the function, which in this case is the sort of the blue region. And it's going to be very small if there are not a lot of points in the persistence diagram that fall within the, the region in blue, which is, again, the domain of the function f. Um, so we use this idea of sort of these adaptive templates to try to distinguish, uh, to do learning with these persistence diagrams. So uh, here is just a simple example. So imagine that you have a bunch of classes you know, represented with colors. And from each one of those classes, you get a persistence diagram that represents that class. So you have the class in blue, the class in purple, the class in, 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 in green. Um, and you know, we've come up with algorithms that can find regions in the persistence diagrams that distinguish one class in blue from another class, for example, in, 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 in pink or, or, or purple. Um, so we, we used sort of this technology in, in tasks like the protein classification ben benchmark collection. So just to give you a sense of size, uh, you have something like uh, 1300 proteins. Uh, each one of them has something like a thousand uh, atoms and you have something like 55 classification tasks across all these, uh, all these data. Um, again, what we did is for each one of those uh, proteins, we computed these topological descriptors, the persistence diagrams, and then ran the classification tasks using these adaptive templates. Um, and, you know, it is always good to end with some numbers that are hopefully high. Uh, so here is the classification, the average classification accuracy across those uh, sort of 55 tasks. So we get something about, you know, 98% accuracy in, in, in classification, but the numbers are not really important, at least today. Um, the, the point I want to make again is, is the idea that topology is the branch of mathematics that thinks about shape and topological data analysis essentially borrows and builds upon uh, topological ideas to try to solve uh, problems in, in data science. Um, thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Jose. Um, encourage everyone to put your questions in the chat. I will get us started, I guess. Uh, I'm really